Okay, good morning class. Welcome back for another lecture. Oh, I think there's an empty seat. Maybe somebody is out today. All right, so hopefully they can, those two students can trickle in, in uh, just in a moment. So uh, let me begin by uh, responding to a few comments. I, th I see some of your questions regarding the homeworks. So uh, the characteristic ratios part is going to be covered today. So we're actually going to talk about that. We touched the base a little bit last lecture. We discussed what it is. But we haven't dived too deep, so today's lecture partially going to cover that. And that should be helpful for those of you who have questions. And some of you ask me which class, uh, which uh, chapter it is. So it's going to be related to the chain confirmation, okay? Only that chapter is current we are covering. So if you still have questions, uh, feel free to let me know. But let's begin today's lecture. All right, I'm going to start with this slide. So use different conditions to describe a polymer chains in physics eyes, uh, in physicist eyes. So what we can see is several models, which coming from the most basic model to step up to more complex model, right? We discussed how most basic model would be free joint chain to free rotation chain to uh, hindered rotation chain or called rotation isomer chain. It depends on who you talk to. But they are both, all those three models are talking about the same thing. <coughs> the polymer coil is not scale with number of bond. It's scale with bond power of 0 0.5 and bond length. It's universally applicable to three model. And that's kind of the beauty of that even the first model is a little bit oversimplified, but still, you can use that to get a scaling relationship, which is still valid, which is typically the case because of the bond, uh, the bond angle and the rotation angle, okay? These bond and theta and phi's could result in uh, increasing of the polymer coil. And we discussed about that. So what we're gonna do today is to Give you guys a few examples how we can use those models to understand it. And in the later part, we're going to explain what is the characteristic ratio, and I'll use the time to answer any questions. And uh, after that, we should finish this three basic models. So if you still have questions for the homework, feel free to reach out to me. I will be around most of the um, afternoon for Tuesday and Thursday. So just shoot me an email. We can set up time to chat. Um, and next class, we're going to have a quick quiz. So just to keep in that in your mind, we're going to talk a little bit about what is relevant to those three models. OK? So coming back to this topic. Um, we talked about those models are fairly easy from free joint chain, then go up in the complexity. And we talked about a few experimental challenges relevant to um, from the free joint chain to self-avoiding chain or self-avoiding walk resulting expansion of that in the last part of the lecture. So that part is slightly more complex because you're no longer scale with n power of 0 0.5, but you're going to be even a little bit bigger. And I ask everybody, what is the special cases that you could actually result in a, a Gaussian coil or free joint chain? I think we kind of explain it to be uh, one condition we explained at the end of the last lecture, which is relevant to theta solvent condition. A solvent that is not so so good, not so bad. You know, it's nice being a mediocre solvent, right? Not too good, not too bad. But that's where the definition is. And this is a special term that we use in polymer physics to describe um, uh, conditions you can validate your model. Okay, that's a theta solvent condition. And from time to time, um, we will discuss how we can actually prepare uh, 
um, solvent that is a SATA solvent because as you imagine, it's just a nice point. Let's say um, it's basically a middle point if you pass the or under 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 um, under shoot, then you're not going to be able to hit it. So there's a couple experimental technique can help you to reach that. These are relevant to uh, some of the experiment we're going to talk about in polymer solution. When we make it in solvents, we can discuss a, a couple of conditions we can reach that in the October when we give the, that part of the lecture. So for today, there is another set of condition. Say the condition is, as you can see, listed as melt. It's actually a very interesting case. Compared to say the solvent, which is kind of hard to, to reproduce and to make, because think about a solvent polymer interaction is case by case, which means if I made a new polymer, my interaction with solvent will be changed. So my say the solvent condition will be different. Specifically, right? So every single polymer, every single solvent, you need to figure out a best say the solvent condition. That's kind of a little bit tricky. So another condition that very easy to generate inside lab is all we need to do is put my old piece of polymer in an oven and heat it above the melting temperature. It will behave like a Gaussian coil. Slightly different with what we have been talking is instead of just the one single chain we draw on board, you have multiple chains coming and going inside a melt. So this is a little bit of a surprise to me when I first learned this back 10 years ago. Why on earth a polymer would behave like idealized the chain, random walk in a melt? Right? It's kind of a mystery. Why? The question is, why it behave like that? So I want to give everybody just a little bit of time to think about your guess for that. Because in the good solvent, as I mentioned, it's chain going to expand. So in the melt, somehow, it decreases. Any any guess? The, the temperature's high enough that uh, there's enough energy in the system to overcome. Uh -huh. That's a good guess, but I don't think that's the case here. So think about in the case of polymer in solvent in solution, you can heat up polymer in solution quite high, but they still going to be. Uh, adopt a self-avoid chain or swollen chain in that case. So there's uh, some other reasons come into play, but that's a very good guess yeah, when you think about it. Decrease in surface energy so that it spoils a little rather than expanding. Um, so that's another interesting thought, but that's close, very close to what so let me give you uh, some historical perspective how this actually happened. So remember who we mentioned? P.J. Flory is this great polymer physicist. He wrote a very famous textbook for the um, back when when back in the Prince, uh, the Cornell University. He was a professor. He wrote a textbook. I think it's titled like Polymer Solution Principle, something like that. In that book, was back in the mid 50s, 60s, nobody measured it. And he just had a pen and a paper working on that. He predicted it. He suggests that in solution, chain will expand. But in the mail, it will behave like idealized chain, like Gaussian coil which nobody could prove that because no technique was available until many, many years later when other techniques such as uh, neutron scattering and deduration labeling come into place, 
people actually can measure polymer conformation in a melt, they found that's true. That's actually very true. This was not the reason he got the Nobel Prize, but um, give you some insight how smart that gentleman is. So his explanation is very simple. In the polymer solution, so when you think about a polymer coil, why they want to be expanded is that so that your polymer polymer has interactions such as you already occupied the space, so there's a repulsive force because I already occupy space, so I need to repel any chain come closer to me, right? I don't want anybody getting closer to me. I have my personal comfort zone, so don't get you know, step too close. But he suggested when the polymer is in the melt, your polymer, think about that Im image is like a packed train, a subway in a New York City in the rush hour. You're surrounded by many of other chains and it is so packed that you cannot tell this hand is from you or your hand or somebody else's hand is like squeezed over you. Of course, you probably will always tell your hand, right? But so hypothetically, let's assume that's the case. You cannot tell if the interaction is from yourself or the other polymer. So in that case, Flory says the polymer cannot sense the repulsion force from itself or repulsion force from someone else. So those two forces would cancel out each other out. Then there's no repulsion force causing the polymer coil to expand just because I don't know if my neighboring polymer chain is coming from myself for another polymer chain. That's a very simple explanation, but speak to um, to the public, then you can understand why in the mild states the polymer coil actually happened to be a theta condition or Gaussian core. Okay? So these are two examples where excluded volume interactions are no longer apply. okay? In normal case, if we just a single chain in solution, it will expand because the expulsion from its it's self neighboring chain or self avoiding one. And there are several significance later on when we study more. So let's take a look at a little bit bookkeeping uh, stuff. Let's talk a little bit more general polymer conformations. In this case, we talked about uh, a polybutyl mesomesaccharate uh, as showing here as a chemical structure. If we want to understand the backbone um, conformation, we can examine its backbone structure. In this case, where we have a carbon, carbon bond, and another carbon, carbon bond, and another one. But I, w I marked the sum of the value here, one and a half, just because this is a degree of polymerization, right? Within this, we see three bonds, but those two bonds are shared by its neighbor, it's not fully accounting by itself. So we need to give a little bit discount. So these two bonds only count a half. So in other words, here is, if we walk along the backbone, and that's what we have in number of bonds. And in this particular case, because within each repeating unit, we only have two carbon carbon bonds. So number of bonds will be equals two times N N is basically uh, DP, degree of polymerization. And it's historically people like to write written as capital N. Okay? So you see why we actually write in this case. And if I tell you a molecular weight and we know the repeating unit, we can use the monomer molecular weight together with its total polymer molecular weight to get the degree of polymerization which is n, and use n to get number of the bonds, and use a bond length, L, 
in carbon-carbon bonds, we assume it's going to be about 0 0.15. Then you can calculate the dimension of the coil for this particular case. OK? Um, there is a little bit more complex case. Uh, if there is not the same number of the same bonds, in this case, it's, we are looking at the structure of polyethylene oxides. So in this case, we're looking at a slightly different structure. We have a carbon bond. We have carbon-oxygen bonds. So that we now need to do a normalization of those two bonds. What we have discussed in the end-to-end -end distance still applies if it's a random coil. So this basically says only the self-turn comes into play. And the cross turn, as we talked about, when i is not equal to j, would cancel out with each other. So even in the P, uh, um, polyethylene oxide case, you can still apply if it's a random, uh, random walk or Gaussian coil by counting how many carbon-carbon bonds versus the bond length square plus number of carbon-oxygen bonds versus the carbon-oxygen bond square. Okay, so you just need to treat separately, but the same assumption, the same uh, requirements still apply. So that's the beauty of free joint chain. So no matter what is the backbone um, you put in there, we just need to count how many kinds of bond and how many bonds are out there. Then you apply this very simple end-to-end -end distance uh, relationship. Similar to like you have a wallet. You have a bunch of $1 bill, you have a bunch of $5 bill, and a bunch of $10 bill. You just need to treat them. No matter if you're someone like clean, you always like to stack $10 bill at the bottom, then five and one, or you randomly shuffle them to be stacked together. It doesn't matter if in this very simple Gaussian coil case. Okay? So this is quite nice, as we see in free joint chain. We can pretty much understand the coil of polymer size if we know the molecular structure, molecular weight, and the bond length. By the way, the carbon carbon bond and carbon oxygen bond is pretty much defined, so you can look it up in, uh, in polymer handbooks, right? Um, we talked about this already, the free joint chain, and we know the free joint chain with the result in expansion factor, which is relevant to the set angle, one plus cosine um, beta and one minus cosine beta, okay? We already covered that. So we, we talked about if there's hetero bond angles, we can also apply the equations still use this nl squared multiplied by expansion factor c infinity, right? So still applies, but you need to consider different bond angle, different bond lengths. So rotation isomer we kind of covered at the last, which we now say we need to have considering two steps of expansion factor. You have influence bond angle, which is given by here, and you have influence bond rotations given by the phi angle, okay? So both the dihedral angle and bond angle will come into play. And this influence of the dihedral angle can be taken by looking at the cosine probability of the distribution of this dihedral angle, which is given by here, okay? It basically says average cosine theta over a proporation potential energy curve. OK? So, and some of you might be curious what did the, this potential energy curve looks like. We kind of this. Why, why this is happening again? Let's try one more time. OK, looking good. I think it's a cable has some problem. I thought the screw has already replaced it. 
I'll mention again to Brad, looks like our cable still have some issue. Anyway, so looking at this one, we kind of talk about what is this rotation isomer state, like I drew on the board. You can have different energy potential depending on this relative rotation of this bond, okay? So this is what we're trying to show. If you have a bulky group on the both end, we can join the schematic as shown here. Um, so now think about rotation. This is a, like uh, your driver's wheel, if you can turn around. But let's fix the other group in the back is not changing. So depending on the front driver's wheel, rotating around 360 degree, there's some configuration you will have bigger hindrance. And big hindrance is coming from just to say this is a too big funky group. If they're in close proximity with the other one, it will cause issues in the energy. Steering hindrance basically says two big bulky ones don't like each other, okay? So which one of them will show the highest energy? Which configuration among those six is least favorable? Bottom center, good. So this one is most close. Which one is lowest? The trans. The trans, right? Because they're quite far away. So there's also other cases when this functional group is in overlapping with another minor group, hydrogen, it will show a local maximum as well, then it will drop. So these are happily sitting in the between in the gap of those two. So if you look at here, you would have peak, a localized peak, but not high stereo peak, then you have a lowest trends, right? Lowest energy. When we start to rotate, it will come to here. So you will have, um, we call it uh, local highest point. Then keep rotating. It will come into this, this state. You will have a gauche state. So what you need to do is just to plot the data out. And typically, we don't require students to calculate what is average potential in the, in the phi angle with the lowest. But conceptually, everybody should know what the significance, what its impact, OK? So now, as I mentioned, you can use this energy potential map to do an integration. This is basically a normalization factor by integrating everything. This will give you the average cosine theta and a uh, cosine phi angle, sorry, cosine phi, OK? So that's how this angle is defined. It's not this particular lower point or that point. It's basically you need to normalize everything and calculate the average energy potential. That's where the phi angle comes into play. You integrate 0 degree to 360 probability, cosine phi and d phi. Once you get this averaged phi angle through your energy diagram, then we can plug in to see the expansion factor comes from this rotation isomer. And you can see these two equations are quite similar, which means expansion factor from bond angle and rotation isomer angle has a similar effect to result in chain expansion. If you rotation isomer states would always prefer you know, a deep trench, so which prefer always this, then your chain will be as well more. If it's a flat curve, then average cosine theta will be uh, zero. Then one minus zero, one plus zero, that means there's no expansion, okay? That's how you can read this particular technique. So, um, Let's move on to here. That particular one is not too important. I'll show you guys an example how to understand this. So this is where we showed 
in one example for polystyrene, and they give you the conformation energy at different states. So this shows how you can get a cosine phi angle based on this potential energy given. What you need to do is to plug in this particular equation to calculate it. And I promise you guys, this is, you need a calculator and we're not gonna test it in the final test because uh, it's too complex in the, in, in, in the calculation. But in the end, you will see, you just need to plug the energy, this uh, uh, gas constant, R, okay? This is a uh, temperature in Kelvin. Room temperature is 298. Because the second energy potential is zero, so E power of zero is one, and we add the second term. Adding together gives you total integrate value. Then you can plug in the other part, which is integrate cosine theta multiplied by this E value. Three different preferred angle, the same energy distribution, e to the power of 4k divided by rt, give you this particular equation, okay? Let's look at the conclusion. This gives you the final value of the um, cosine theta, um, the, the value on the top, and you have the bottom. You can calculate what is the average cosine theta equals to 0 0.255, okay? So now, it tells you due to the preference of low energy conformation, then you can see average, the most probability average bound angle is about 75 degree phi angle. And if you plug this value in, you can see the expansion angle is gonna be have a little bit influence on the bonding, but not a lot, right? Okay, so now let's move on to the next part. We're gonna chat about what is characteristic ratio. As I mentioned, no matter what, what bond and what structure, what model we use, free joint chain, free rotation chain, rotation isomer chain, we can unify three models with a single term called a characteristic ratio. As I already mentioned, this is the most idealized case, free joint chain. In most instances, in real world, it's not the, gonna be the value, right? So there's also always gonna be expansion. So we can rewrite as, define this characteristic ratio would be C infinity, n to n square, average divided by n L square. This is theoretical n to n distance using a free joint chain. This is the actual one. So let's take a look at the here. What if C infinity equals to one? A free joint chain, right? It's, it's basically the same as free joint chain, so you, your, your, your coordinate expand. If this is a free rotation chain or other cases, you would have increase. Actually, that when you need to consider a number of bonds. Why? Because if your is a polymer is oligomer, it will be slightly different because your number of bond rotation angle is so, so limited in conformation, they will result a significant increase. So in many cases in polymer, number of bonds is way here, okay? This is only maybe 10, 20 bonds, so you have a smaller expansion ratio. But if you have polymer, it's very big. So we plot three lines here. We basically tell you free rotation chain has expansion, independent, hinder rotation with basically free rotation chain with fixed theta, and this particular independently hinder rotation is nothing is fixed, so you can, everything is moving around. You can see expansion factor, this is about six, this is about two, depends on different case. So 
In the most realistic case, there's, there is limitation in bond angle, there is limitation in bond rotation, and theta and phi, you have biggest expansion. However, I don't think right here, everything can still scale with n to the power of 0 0.5. That's the beauty of three different models, no difference. So how do you define characteristic ratio in the homework? I think this is something everybody cares about. So if you see this, can someone make a motion to suggest how we can address the homework problem? We are given by molecular weight, and we are given by end-to-end -end distance. Right? So you can use. I'll give everybody a hint. You can use, assume a, a certain molecular weight, then you can get end-to-end -end distance, correct? Then if you know the molecular weight, you can calculate what is, that's a real end-to-end -end distance we can get from the homework, but you can also get the theoretical end-to-end -end distance based on how, how high, your molecular weights are, then if you know these two parameters, you should be able to get the characteristic ratio. Okay? Sounds good? Give yourself a try. It's fun to try new things. So, how do we um, understand characteristic ratios for a wide range of polymer we know? So, let's go from the top. We know characteristic ratio is basically given by here. And I like to explain in the layman's term, that's like expansion ratio for your polymer coil, how much size it's being expanded, right? The higher the C infinity, that means your polymer is more expanded or swollen compared to free joint chain. And this can be easily defined by theta and phi angle coming from the two other models we talked about. OK, what's the significance? So let's take a look at these. Those are some of the commonly reported polymer, but people also measured already what the C infinity is. It should be in your team largest textbook. So let's take a look. Polyethylene has characteristic ratio of 6.7. Polystyrene has 10.0. Polypropylene vice versa. Polyethylene oxide is actually pretty small. Polycarbonate is even smaller. Okay. This tells you how different geometry and rigidity of your polymers are. In the next class, we're going to discuss even more detail. C infinity is also proportional to the chain rigidity expansion ratio. Okay, those three are interchangeable. Expansion ratio comes from the bond angle, etc. This results in the bigger the C infinity, the more rigid the polymer coils backbones are and the bigger they expand. And we will discuss what is uh, uh, another term when people talk about chain rigidity called persistence length fairly soon. So let's take a look at the, the polystyrene. In our example, um, which we, we could revisit, based on the bond angle and the theta angle. It does not agree so well, just because we, we, we in the theoretic model, we do miss some parameter, OK? So you can see, in, it, these are all experimental measures, which is tend to be more accurate. OK, so one of the reasons why our theoretical model doesn't match is because in real case, the bond rotation cannot be ro freely rotating. So one bond rotation can be influenced by the other, which is known by steering hindrance effect. That's why there is a mismatch where we calculated based on simple model, um, which ignored all the bond interaction, et cetera, with the resulting underestimate of characteristic ratio for polystyrene. Okay? 
this is uh, because of this reason. You can see this would impact the, the energy rotation potential. It's not, no longer going to be that beautiful symmetric uh, gauche trans cis model we dis just described. All right? So the most accurate way in polymer is still measuring it. We're going to talk about in October how we measure them. There are several techniques we can measure. Uh, scattering, light scattering technique is one of them. And uh, there is also a technique you can use osmotic pressures in polymer solution to look at how polymer rigidities are. But for now, you just need to know our model is still you know, a little bit limited just because we didn't consider even the three model, free joint chain, free rotation, rotation isomer chain, has a certain limitation. OK, with the next uh, couple minutes, I'm going to start to introduce a concept, and we will re-pick up in the next lecture. So we talked about all the different uh, coil size, right? We talked about different chain models. We realized that, uh, for example, polystyrene has a, a, a bigger characteristic ratio. But end-to-end -end distance is unfortunately not a great way to see which polymer is rigid than the other? I'll explain to you why. End-to-end -end distance depends on value of n, which is degree of polymerization, right? So higher the molecular weight, your molecular coil will expand. Higher the molecular weight, the bigger I am. So even the polystyrene from the data, we know it's going to be rigid than polyethylene. But if you compare low molecular weight polystyrene versus high molecular weight polyethylene, the end to end distance polyethylene is going to be bigger. So we cannot use REE to describe which one is more rigid. And rigidity has many impacts in polymer physics in terms of influence their entanglement behavior. The rigidity could impact the polymer's mechanical response. So there is a lot of need for people to understand how rigid the polymer coils are. Size doesn't <coughs> translate to rigidity. OK? These two parameters are independent. That's why here it comes into play. I'm going to explain to you chain flexibility is another parameter that we're going to teach. And there is a parameter we can describe chain rigidity using a concept called persistence lens. Let's take a look at quickly three examples. This represents roughly three different polymer coil has different degree of flexibility. Something is highly flexible, which means the polymer chain basically looks like a very soft yarn. You can twist it, move it around. It's just very soft, very flexible. Coming to be more, more rigid is semi-flexible. You can imagine this is a garden hose. There's certain rigidity in the Garden hose don't want to be bent at the size scale about less than, uh, uh, let's say, 10 inches, right? It's very hard. Some of those hard PVC um, garden hose is notorious rigid in winter when it's cold. And then you have very rigid one, which some of the polymer behave that like. If you have a lot of polymer conjugation, which means double bonds or bending ring around the backbone, you can result in very rigid polymer. In real life, you can think about uh, stainless steel rods, which is very rigid, almost impossible to bend, right? From this soft, semi-rigid, to very rigid. How do we define? And I want to ask everybody a question. What would you propose to describe their rigidity? Size scale is not, uh, not useful, right? As I mentioned, end-to-end -end distance, they can be the same as show here, R roughly, roughly. But it's not translated to rigidity. So if you were someone 
able to define a new physics term, how would you like to define it? Please? Um, average length before it turns back on itself? Geniuses. <laughs> you must be stealing my mind. That's exactly right. What the student just said is how long it takes the polymer to bend back. There's two kind of typical ways people define. If you can talk about how long it takes this polymer chain to bend by 90 degree, in the layman's term, this is called persistence length. So how strong this polymer want to maintain its directionality, right? Directionality, which means which direction I'm going. So if I maintain a long distance, then I know this is very rigid. So which means this rigid polymer won't going to maintain its directionality long, long distance until you start to see its loose directionality. This, not as good as that one. This quickly loses directionality, right? It's quickly it turns. So that's a very good term to describe rigidity of the polymer. So we're going to talk more in the next lecture about this particular interesting concept called persistence lens. So if you have some time, you can take a look at the textbook. In the Ting Lodge's textbook, we're going to uh, um, have a, actually a good chapter dedicated to look at chain rigidity, persistence lens. But let me give you a hint. Persistence length is somehow well tied into this characteristic ratio. The higher the characteristic ratio, the rigid the polymers are. I just want to get this message out to you. I want to ask you everybody to think about why that's the case. Why C infinity is tied into rigidity of the polymer? And we will give all the answers in the next class, OK? Everybody, any more question for today's lecture when we talk about characteristic ratio a little bit more detail and show a couple of examples how we can get what these value? Any question? If not, then let's wrap up today's class and you can always reach out to me if you have questions more for the homework, okay? Otherwise, I'm looking forward to see everybody again next Tuesday and uh, see the, all the homeworks. All right. Just do one second, let yeah. me turn off.